to the National Art Museum Beauty. My name's Doug Hill, and I've been ably assisted by my lovely wife Rachel, who is filming me yet again. A couple of little points. I apologise a for the background noise. That's the heat of fans within this area of the museum running, and b that I've got these earbuds in because of the background noise. It's very difficult to record because we're using a standard iPhone. So today I'm going to talk to you about this car. This is the 1909 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, one of the most important cars that we have for Bewley. It's got a very long Bewley history, in excess of half its life here at Bewley, and a particular favour of Edward Lord Montague, and um, done a lot of things which you'll hear about later. So I want to talk to you just generally about the Rolls-Royce mark, and then about this particular car and its history. So in 1909, the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, that particular model, was two years old. In 1907, when the first Silver Ghosts came out, one of the first cars, if not the first car, was painted silver. These cars are generally known as the 40, 50 horsepower Rolls Royces. Again, an RAC rating of four stroke and number of cylinders. And there was one particular car painted silver, which was registration AX201, which indeed is still owned, I believe, by Rolls-Royce Heritage. And that car, because it was silver, because they were very, very quiet cars, they decided to make the known, or they decided, they were generally known as the Silver Ghost. And so all of these series of chassis were Silver Ghosts. Now, when you bought a Rolls-Royce 4050 horsepower, you bought the chassis and then you took the car to your favourite coachworks for the body to be built, or you could go through a catalogue and choose. This particular car had a, a Barker Rwanda Belt body on it uh, in 1909 when it was sold from Rolls-Royce Works to its owner, a Laird up in Borderland, Scotland. Prior to its sale, though, this car was used around the Brooklyn circuit, which was formed in 1907, so the circuit was only two years old. And it was used for measuring fuel consumption, oil consumption, water temperatures, um, speed, power, and we have all of those records from Rolls-Royce in our archive here at Bewley. It's absolutely fascinating reading what this car did. The car then went, as I say, to the borderland of Scotland, and the Laird, wanted the car to have wire wheels, experimental wire wheels by Rudge Whitwell. Yeah, as I said, had the Barker Rider Belt body, and the Laird used it extens extensively from 1909 through to the start of the Great War. He went to be called up, uh, went to, to war, uh, to fight for England, and sadly, he never made it. He uh, didn't survive the war, but the car was subsequently sold to the local garage um, because it was a store in storage at the local garage and it was taken in lieu of payment for that storage. They claimed the car. But they subsequently sold the car to the local undertakers, as was the fate of many of these cars, and it was used as a hearse for, for maybe 10 years. The garage in Dundee then bought, bought the car back and they used it as a breakdown truck. And subsequent to that, it was then used at a local farm around the Dundee area as a flatbed pickup truck. Now to show you this, I have we've been very lucky to have these archive pictures of the car. So this is a car being bodied as a Rolls-Royce hearse. You can see at this time it has wooden wheels, and I'll talk a bit about those wheels in a moment. And then, as I said, it was used for some 10 years as a hearse, and then it came back to the garage in Dundee, and this is the same car, and there is our Rolls-Royce as a three-ton breakdown truck, complete with a Morris Cowley hanging on the back of it. And then, once 
it had been used as a breakdown truck. I said it was used as a flatbed. And this is the car as it was when Edward Lord Montague purchased it. Then the car was, the chassis was restored by our workshops here, and the car was rebodied by Leslie Willis, um, who was from Biggin Hill in Kent, and he recreated this Rouen Belge body. It's not quite a true copy of the original body, but we'll go around the, around the car and have a look. So if you'd like to come in closer now, I will show you a few features about the car. First of all, the mascot, the Spirit of Ecstasy. That mascot is not original to the car because that came out in 1911 and this is a 1909 car. I will explain more about that at another day. The lady that modeled the, the mascot is a lady called Eleanor Thornton who was John Scott Montague, Edward Montague's father, John Scott Montague's PA. And then the long sweeping line body in the Roi de Belge with the very typical swirl here and the beautiful, beautifully opulent buttoned upholstery. And this is actually the Montague crest, a part of the Montague crest here, coach painted quite recently and if you look at the wonderful finish of this paintwork this is all brush painted and all the lining is done by hand. Now if you go along here we'll, we'll uh, have a look at the features of the car. This is a, a battery box and a toolbox. If you'd like to look inside the car, I'll go around the other side. And I will show you on the dashboard here. This is the uh, coil box for the ignition coil. The um, three position switch for magneto, magneto and battery and just pure battery. This is the uh, CAV lighting panel, um, switches for individual lights. The starter button, which is a more modern add-on to the starter motor, oil pressure gauge. The pedal arrangement is as per a modern car, clutch, brake and throttle. We don't use the foot brake very much because that works on the transmission and will cause a lot of damage to the back axle if you stamped on that very hard. And this is called a double Elliott and it's one's a speedometer and one the other bottom part is a trip, trip meter. And then if you look up here on the steering column, you'll see governor, which is the hand throttle, the mixture, the ignition timing, advance and retard, and the original switch for the battery magneto, um, which we don't use on this car. We do on the 1909 Rolls Royce, uh, sorry, the 1914 Rolls Royce, not this one. But that's a whole different story. Anyway, if you'd like to come round, and I will show you some more features of the car. I have to turn the mascot sideways to open the bonnet because her wings foul the, uh, the bonnet here. And here we have the beautiful Rolls-Royce 4050 horsepower engine. So this is a six cylinder, over seven and a half liter six cylinder. This is a carburetor. It has a heater 
to heat the air going into the engine. So a heated muff on the air intake. This is all the governor assembly. This pipe running along here, the small bore pipe is an oil feed into the directly into the cylinder bores. And when you push the throttle hard down, you're accelerating hard, it brings this lever down here. I'll demonstrate that by pushing the throttle down. And that opens an extra oil valve and puts oil straight into the bore. This device here is called an exhauster. That takes pulses from the exhaust gases and puts pressure into the fuel tank. As I say, there's a steering box here, the water pump, and this is the coil side of the ignition. Uh, and I'll show you that moving when I move the advanced and retard. That's retarded, that's advanced, moving the ignition timing as per your need. So this car, I explained, had originally had experimental Rudge Whitworth wheels, but now we have these wheels called Warland detachable rims, and this is the Warland dual rim, you'll see it here. One of the big problems in the early days of motoring was removing the wheel to change the tire. Most cars, you couldn't actually take the whole wheel off, you had to disassemble the bearing assembly, etc. With this, you undo this ring of nuts here. This outer rim comes off, and then if you come around to the spare wheel here, this spare wheel goes onto that wooden rim and locates with that outer metal band and clamps in there and that locates the wheel. And on the rear wheels you've got lugs to take the drive as well. So that made it much easier to change, change a wheel. Around this side we have another battery because this has got two electrical systems, a 4 volt system for the ignition coil and a 12 volt system for the electrics. And another press, and if I show you in the back, you'll see how wonderful it is and the M for Montague embossed on the leather of the door pocket. And I'll close the door again. And you'll see this is the cable to the rear brakes. There is a rod from the bottom of the, bottom of the handbrake pulling on here. It's one brake cable, loops all the way around, right the way around, through, the, through a tube, and then goes to the other side. So that brake cable sliding across in that tube actually is a brake compensator. As I say, this car's done lots and lots and lots of things. And Lord Montague actually took this car to New Zealand um, and did a tour of New Zealand with it in the late um, 60s. And it did the Alpine Trial in 1968 and 1972. And one of the things that this car, when it was first restored, it had the wrong height radiator. And so we soon found the right height radiator and got a smaller radiator in it. But then that put the whole car, made the whole car out of proportion. So quite a lot of work had to be done to make the body look proportional after the radiator was lowered, such as trimming down the mud guards and things like this. Now Leslie Willis, who built the car, the bodywork on the car, he was a he was a great one for um, using bits and pieces he had behind. And if you come round and have a look here, I will show you. These windscreen supports here are actually towel rails that he got from his bathroom. And also you'll see there's a slight mark in here. You'll see a little blowhole in the brass, brass work here. 
And that is because Edward Lord Montague in 1972 decided he didn't want to pay the transportation cost of the, this car to be taken to Switzerland for the start of the Alpine trial and he put it on motor rail on the train. And even with the bonnet folded, uh, sorry, the windscreen folded flat as this does, it was just too tall to get onto the train. So my predecessor, who was with the car at the time, cut the windscreen off, got the car onto the train, and when it got to Switzerland, silver soldered the brass frame together. I do not know what he did about the, um, the length of the windscreen, but I have seen a picture where the windscreen is tilted quite a long way back. So I should imagine the windscreen was probably too long as well. Um, and they just had to put up with that. You see here is the oil tank. Um, that's an auxiliary oil tank. There has a certain amount in the sump and when the oil level gets low, you open a tank and just drain some more oil down through. It's very difficult to explain what these cars are like to drive, but I would say that the torque within the car is phenomenal. This car in third gear, which is actually a direct drive top, is capable of pulling away on tick over on the flat in third gear, in top gear. And as I said earlier, the, it's got a four speed gearbox. The fourth gear is an overdrive top, it's called the sprinter gear. It wasn't to be used generally on the open road because it's a straight cut gear and it's quite noisy, and that's not what Rolls Royce were about. But it did mean that you could consume a lot of miles. And the, you can hear the whole car actually resonating because it doesn't have a torsional vibration damper in 1909 on a six cylinder, so it, it's uh, an imbalance within the engine, it's half a harmonic imbalance. The whole car pulses as you drive down the road. It's really quite interesting to hear. But that again does not reduce its, uh, its capability. It is very capable cruising at 40 miles an hour all day. Um, is quite equally happy at 50 miles an hour. I think 60 is getting a bit fast for it. Um, but if they said to me, Doug, this car's got to go to Edinburgh and there's no truck available, we just fill it up with fluids and drive it, it is that good. So a couple of tales about this car. As I said, Rob Montague took it to New Zealand. Uh, he and I did a tour of England, starting in Edinburgh and uh, for the Veteran Car Club, we did a tour of, of the UK. And indeed, going through um, the Lake District, I actually broke one of the road springs and the um, back, of, back end of the road, road spring, mainly the road spring had broken. And so the car was sat over one side and didn't quite know what to do, but we were by the stately home within the grounds of, so we very carefully drove it into this stately home where Lord Montague introduced himself to the owner. We had the facilities of the um, maintenance team and I managed to put two flat pieces of iron each side of the chassis, get a block of English oak and rest the broken spring on the block of oak so that would slide on the chassis between the two pieces of flat steel and drove it then to Lake Windermere, where the, the overnight stop was, about 40 miles very carefully like that. Overnight, I managed to get another leaf of the spring, um, come up from stratford upon avon and we fitted that overnight and were able to use the car the next day. In 2005, um, Edward Lord Montague and I drove this car from the south of Jordan, right the way up to the Syrian border, up to, uh, from Aqaba, right the way up through the Dead Sea, via Petra, uh, alongside the Dead Sea, up to the uh, capital, Amman, and also um, to the Syrian border, as I say, um, and it appeared at Jurash, temperatures of 37, 38 degrees during the day. We did go up to uh, the, um, we climbed some mountains with it and this car did actually boil on one day only, but 
only on one occasion. The 1914 rolls, which were, I took there two years earlier, um, didn't boil at all. Indeed, that was the only uh, pre-war car that didn't boil on the event. One particular trip that would stand um, out in my mind with this car is that Edward Lord Montagnon and I drove this car from Delhi to Mumbai. 2,800 miles through the Raj palaces, through the Tiger country, and we uh, had quite a few near misses and experiences with the car. Uh, if anybody's driven in India, you will know what truck drivers are like, and when you've got three trucks coming, in, coming up a long incline at you as you turn the corner, going downhill, down a steep mountain, um, with only rear wheel brakes and you've got the whole road filled up with trucks, um, that does become quite entertaining. Uh, we managed to avoid that. But one, one particular day is we were in a tiger reserve, driving through a tiger reserve, and Lord Montague decided at the time that it was going to be a good idea to stop, have a comfort break, and enjoy the countryside. Well, I was very aware that it was uh, tiger, tiger country, so I was keeping the weather eye out, looking all around. We stopped for about 20 minutes, something like this. Lord Montague and I were taking in turns to, to drive the car two hours on, two hours off, because we had a lot of miles to consume. We did this trip in nine days. And it was my turn to drive. I jumped in, everybody got in, and we started to drive off, and I heard a thump, 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 thump under the car. That noise had, was not there at all prior to us pulling up. I couldn't think what was wrong, so I pulled over very quickly. And it was relevant with the speed of the car as well. As we, as we pulled up, it would thump, 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 and then stopped. I pulled over, looked underneath the car. Lord Montague said, well, what's the matter? And I said, that's all right, stay where we are, sir. Jumped up in, back into the car, drove off. He goes, well, what's the noise? What's happening? And it's thump, 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 thump. Got louder and louder and louder, and then stopped. I then went on to explain that the noise from underneath the car was a snake that wrapped itself around the prop shaft. And when I pulled over, it was looking very dazed and hanging from the prop shaft. And I wasn't going to get tangled up with that. So as I drove off, we drove until the noise stopped, which was indeed the snake falling off. So that was that. So 1909 Rolls Royce, probably one of our most famous, has been in all sorts of films has done lots of events with Lord Montague, a great favourite with Edward Lord Montague. And a very sour but very proud moment for me was that Lord Montague said for Edward's funeral that he asked me if I would uh, do him the honour of driving the car to take his father on his last road trip and we reverted back to a former part of this car's history. We made a frame to carry Edward Lord Montague's coffin off the car, and I took him, very proud to say that I took him on his last ride in a Rolls Royce to the Beauty Abbey Church in this car. Very fond of this car, as you can probably tell, um, and uh, we've done, it's a great car, it's done lots of miles, it still has a lot of miles left in it, and a lot to give. It's just a fabulous thing. I hope you've enjoyed this little insight into the car and uh, everything it is. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for your comments on my last video. Again, filmed by my lovely wife, Rachel, who's done a grand job again today. And I apologize for the, for the noise, but uh, here we are in lockdown again, as you can see, and uh, in December, so we need the heating on in the museum. Thank you and bye-bye.